Hello, everyone. Welcome to another BAF event. Um, today, I'm very happy to be uh, with Sasha Woodzilin. Uh, Sasha leads business development uh, at Near Protocol. Um, Sasha, if you can turn your camera and mic on uh, so you can come up to the screen. There you go. I'm actually very, very excited to be here with Sasha. I've been looking forward to this talk uh, for a while. Um, before we start, just a little bit of background um, about BAF and what we do. We're a 501c3 nonprofit uh, that starts accredited blockchain courses, runs educational events such as this one, um, work on projects, uh, and generally, you know, um, starts this machine uh, for the next generations of talent uh, for the blockchain industry. Um, we're also um, helping people to find jobs. So, if you're looking for a job in the space, us. Um, with that said, a little bit about Sasha. Um, Sasha studied business at Berkeley, um, spent some years in investment finance, uh, then shifted to um, marketing and selling software. And now, as I said, is leading business development at Near Protocol. Um, very excited about this talk because we always run technical talks where we dive deep into technology, and all sort of stuff. But um, today I wanna take more of a business focus, talk about trends, talk about opportunities. And I think Sasha, you're the best man for this. So welcome. <laughs> nice, nice to be here. Thank you for inviting. Absolutely. Um, so I guess we can start from, you know, what we've all witnessed in the past months. Uh, this bull run, it's been amazing. Um, you know, a lot of excitement around crypto, a um, lot of new projects. Uh, um, you've been in crypto for quite a while, and also you work on a daily basis with projects, uh, and you're at the cutting edge of innovation. Um, I would like to start off by asking you, what do you see um, that is going differently uh, between now and 2017? Um, is, was 2017 more built on promise and now we're building on products. Um, what are things that you see uh, similar to the 2017 hype uh, and what is that you see different uh, and where are we going? Mm -hmm. yeah, it's actually a super interesting question. So I was I was not as active involved, uh, actively involved in, in crypto in 2017. My first interaction with crypto was actually in 2017. I was working in, in MemSQL it's a distributed database company. And uh, one of the engineers there was very interested in, in crypto. He was trying to get me excited about different altcoins. And he was saying like, there is a lot of kind of excitement. I should pay attention. I was kind of like not sure about the technology at the time. I was not sure about the excitement about prices, but I kind of went really deep into this uh, uh, August, 2018. So that's when we started Near, And so for, for the context, Near is a layer one uh, protocol. Uh, it's scalable. We also focus a lot on development tool, developer tooling and usability. So those are kind of like main focus for us. And so for 90% of our time at Near, um, since we existed since August 2018, uh, we've been in the bear market. So it was very kind of like building. Um, uh, not many people, to my knowledge, were kind of excited about crypto outside of like people I just talked in, in crypto. When I was talking to recruiters, uh, people were actually living the space. So when I would talk to recruiters from different investors we work with, they were saying like, yeah, like I see people moving to like FinTech away from crypto actually. And so now all of a sudden we have the situation, which is like to your point, similar to 2017, we're actually getting to the to the bull market. For me, it's like a very new thing. Or for anyone in, in New York, it's like very kind of thing we never experienced essentially. Um, and I think what's different, if I were to compare again, I don't have like full insights on what was happening in 2017, but at least the way I, I think about it, the, the comparison I would make is that early internet kind of had this thing where people were, were using like BitTorrents, for example, and they were uh, essentially um, uh, called piracy, you know, uh, but, but in, in fact, it was a pent up demand for people to uh, share files and then later manifested in beautiful products. Like for, so for example, people were exchanging music uh, and people would call it pi piracy, right? Like people trying to send, send each other music files. But then we saw right after that, we saw Spotify being created, right? And, and funny enough is that the, the founder and CEO of Spotify actually was CEO of one of the torrent companies before. So he saw this pent up demand happening on the music side and he productized it. He, he made a beautiful product, st streaming music product, right? L later on, essentially. And so if you think about 2017, how it relates to crypto is that 
you can call uh, like this ICO kind of euphoria as just a bunch of kind of scam and, and everything. I actually look at this differently. I think about it as a, it's a pent up demand. There, there was a demand on behalf of the community to actually um, to have like economic, deeper economic participation in projects, right? So like essentially uh, in IPO context, people can only participate once companies go public. Right now in, in Silicon Valley for tech companies it takes 10 plus years to go public. And, uh, and and so we saw this demand actually, pent up demand, the same way how early in, in, in a bit, bit torrent space, there was a demand for music sharing and maybe listening to music, for example, on the internet for the first time. Here, similarly, we had different kind of demand. It was demand for economic participation in different protocols from early on, right? And so you can call it scam. I, ca I call it actually, um, people are actually interested. Now the products themselves actually were not good. Right, it was it was no Sp no Spotify at that point in time, and so I think now going into what's happening right now, I think what, what was very important I think post 2017 is that a lot of very um, talented people joined the space. So 2018, like when Nier, for example, joined the space, uh, everyone uh, in Nier was out, uh, coming from the outside of the crypto, but kind of like coming with understanding this opportunity, the, the cycles of ups and downs kind of in the script that already happened like four of them historically 2011 2013 2017 and right now they bring a lot of talent to, with it and so i think right now we, we're starting to see first initial like applications that have a real shot at like consumer adoption actually like this like spotify like experience killer apps uh, can can actually be uh, be created so example of that would be audios it's a music streaming service and they, they actually grew last year from 200 thousand months like of listeners to like a million and so it's a real like consumer app. You can download it on your phone. It will have a economy on top of this. Um, royalties will be dispersed very differently. And so I actually see it as very, very valuable because now that these apps actually exist, I can actually talk to my friends from the outside of crypto and show them some like tangible example of what, what can exist. Like here's a consumer app that you can download on Apple, um, Apple Store, essentially, um, that shows you that Web3 is actually tangible. It's not some the common kind of criticism of Web3 space is that it's very like abstract. It's like I talk to my friends and they're like, yeah, like, okay, you mentioned like 95% of stuff you mentioned is very abstract. Like I, I want to see something. And so I think we're like very early in this stage where finally we're starting to see real stuff. And I, I'm like super interested in this human adoption, consumer apps essentially. And then on a, on a capital side, what's happening in terms of like next kind of bulls, bull, bull run is that I think uh, it's just a lot more... Um, enterprises like um like larger institutional capital is joining the space it usually takes a couple of years for them to enter the space they're kind of like mildly interested back in the day now they're actually entering the space and so we saw quite a bit of like regulations related to banks like interested in in, in uh, um, using digital assets for example and central banks um like playing around with with those assets so i think it's like for real like a lot bigger kind of capital is entering the space and like it was like a retail participation in 2017 so i think it's very very different right now it's more of a like institutional capital joining and on a, on a actual applications and adoption side of things it's like very talented teams are working on those things and they're finally kind of coming to fruition it was like this build-up phase like 2018 2019 was very quiet years when people are just building 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 and now we're having like releases of different things most protocols like layer ones that launched a bunch of them launched late last year including near but also applications, this early uh, consumer applications. I see it was more, you know, 2017, we needed to like weed out all the, you know, layer ones that were kind of like fake and scams. Uh, we had, we witnessed this build up of like legit layer one projects. Uh, so now we're ready for the next generation of products, uh, uh, which I mean, sounds very exciting. Uh, um, just quick follow up question to what you said. Um, where are some of the industries uh, um, you see, you know, in the short term uh, being like having this type of products uh, you mentioned, you know, uh, like music, for example, uh, where are some of the industries you, you know, you're also more, more excited about or, and you see in your day to day work? Mm -hmm. So it's definitely when we think about adoption uh, at Nero, we definitely see that um, digital first goods are definitely the ones where the, the least amount of interaction with real world you have, the more likely this use case will be unlocked in a big way sooner. 
Another important component is like product teams, the quality of product teams, and also how big is the pain in existing industries. So in case of audio music, it was actually like artists' uh, pain point with their ability to put things online. So in terms of like other industries, I think that uh, might come next in terms of like big in a big way on, on in crypto is gaming, uh, esports, um, what else? Consumer applications, um, more more so um, launching. Um, NFT space is like definitely he heating up and it's like a real opportunity for like artists to get paid, which is like also important to mention here because like uh, if you think about developers and, and, and artists and creators, they're kind of like similar in that they create things like developers create software, artists create something else, except for the differences that developers are like really well paid across the board, regardless of which geography you're in versus the artists actually have a very, very hard time like um, getting by, especially in a COVID time when a lot of offline events were shut down, right? And so we saw uptick in, in, in people's willingness to, uh, to to try digital channels for the first time. I saw a lot of artists, like we work with like four or five different like NFT marketplaces and different like, art art marketplaces. And we, we saw like with some of them, there was uptick in, in uh, like otherwise not interested artists to, part to participate in like digital tech. Uh, for the first time during COVID time, actually were like super open about it because they were looking for like additional revenue streams. And now with NFTs, and now people can, can actually get paid. So the one example actually will send in a, in a chat here, the NFT marketplace where like, I know quite a bit of artists that are actually starting to get paid there. Um, and that's like example of like my, my friends p p putting their, you know, like pictures there and, and actually get, getting paid on, on the other side. And it feels like, wow. Like <laughs> I, I know you're... Um... You have quite of a, a meme uh, history. There's a lot of a bunch of memes with you know yourself. So <laughs> are you are you planning on tokenizing yourself and issue a Sasha token soon? <laughs> That's actually funny. So like on the, on the meme side, yeah. So there's a collection of <laughs> memes of myself uh, on Telegram that was created by one of They're our so engineers. Great. <laughs> Hey, he's actually became better and better with every new meme. He becomes better and better at art. We were actually, we were thinking about putting it on um, on NFT marketplace. For now, uh, I think we didn't get accepted yet as a, <laughs> maybe our art is not good enough uh, or something. Um, and uh, and separately on a social token site and like issuing tokens, actually I have some friends um, uh, in, in engineering team and in near who are like thinking heavily in terms of issuing their own tokens and actually creating a kind of like marketplace, kind of like a new way to do like capitalism, kind of like, for example, like I can do like introductions to people in exchange for like Sasha coin or somebody else can do like a quick prototype or example application in exchange for like Vlad coin for this guy, for example. So it's definitely something that we'll also see a lot of experimentations, like social token space feels like very early, very like experimental. But uh, but I can I can see how it can become a lot bigger. I, yeah, I mean there there have been some some artists. I mean, there's a, uh, you know Lil Pump, Lil Yachty. I mean they're they're big names. They just tokenize themselves. Uh, uh, I'm a big football fan. When I say football, I mean soccer. Uh, my favorite team, AC Milan, uh, just announced that they're gonna release a ACM token. Uh, other major European clubs, such as Juventus, Barcelona, Roma, PSG, uh, they're already on Binance. You can stake BNB and get their token back. Um, so this, I, I agree with you. This you know tokenization model uh, is really going to be a breakthrough um, in many many sectors in many industries. Um, but I want to take a step back uh, um, and go back to more macro trends. Uh, Today is a pretty big day uh, in the United States, a new president. Uh, um, I don't want to go into politics here, but, you know, there are also, there's also a lot of buzz uh, around, you know, the, the next, um, um, you know, SEC nominee. Um, Biden has nominated Gary Gensler, who's uh, very crypto friendly. Um, so I was wondering from your perspective, how do you see this new administration uh, uh, approaching the world of crypto also based on like what other countries are doing and of course i'm thinking of china uh, which has just announced uh, uh, that they're probably gonna re um, release a, a digital currency in 2021 so what are your thoughts around this yeah so my, my thoughts on that front is that actually if you look at china specifically they uh um, and and for for us at Near, for example, like what's interesting, and I'll just start with China, is that 
um, like one of our co-founders was actually like fairly prominent in artificial intelligence space. He was like early days of Google at TensorFlow when it was getting started. And so essentially the, he, he saw China approach to artificial intelligence and he saw like American approach to ar artificial intelligence was like bottoms up in US case versus um, kind of like very top down kind of like, okay, like this is new strategic technology for us, AI. Let's, let's put a lot of kind of top down um, regulations into this. And so um, fast forward to today, actually China is ahead of US when it comes to R&D in artificial intelligence. And, and the guy who worked on this, he actually lives in China now. So, <laughs> so it tells you a little bit about how he thinks about China. Um, in their approach to technology. And so a couple of years ago, um, China decided to actually make blockchain as one of their strategic ne next strategic technologies. So similar how they, there was a particular point in time when they decided artificial intelligence to be a strategic technology. There was a point in time when they decided that blockchain will be strategic technology for them. Last year, they did 75 POCs in, in, in terms of their like central bank uh, related to blockchain. Um, China has a lot of countries that owe them a lot of money um, across the world. And so they're, Next step is essentially use Roten Roten Bell Initiative to um, to uh, to get countries that owe money to China to uh, start to use their technology. In this case, money is a technology, um, and so th this is a very strategic point in time. It will take probably like I don't know, call it ten years, but essentially every every time we look at the history, like last four hundred years, when four times there was a change in in a, who is number one country in the world in terms of GDP. Last time this change was 1945 when, when Great Britain became number two, US became number one. Every time there is a change happening and change is about to happen, uh, the the global reserve currency changes. Usually takes another like five to 10 years, but global currency changes. And so today it's USD. It was there for decades. The question is like, if we will see in our generation, the switch, the flip. And so a lot of people are not bullish on this, right? People like, would I ever use Chinese currency, like completely different, like ethos, right? But um, th they will try to. What if, if you're forced to? <laughs> yes, exactly. And so on US front, like if, if you're like US, actually, you have to, you already be pretty behind, actually, if, if you think about like what China did with, with blockchain in the last couple of years and, and what US is now trying to catch up to. Uh, it's actually quite a few years on uh, behind, and and so we need, in fact, like as as a as a country, we need to figure out like what is like, what is the kind of the right approach there. And in fact, actually, let me show you. There is um, I'll 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 I'll, publ I'll put something here in the chat that actually discusses this different approaches that U.S. can take. Oh, nice. And, and so this. They specifically, essentially, it's Electric Capital, like one of the Web3 investors, and they're specifically talking in this article about different approaches the U.S. government can take uh, to kind of like, essentially, they're saying like, okay, there's a gap for a couple of years behind. U.S. is a couple of years behind. What can we do, actually? And so I really hope that Biden administration will will get to um, to implement some of the strategies. I think it's 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 very hard to it's very hard to predict at this point, like how it's going to uh, shape up. But I see. I, and actually, yeah, I was about to ask you like a follow-up question to this, but do, do you see since there's this gap, do you think that the American government will approach the private sector for like a faster solution rather than build one in-house? Uh, do you see that as a possibility? Also given, you know, like the history of the U.S. like being very private oriented, like going to the industry. Yeah, exactly. So what you're saying is like exactly how they should do. So in fact, this recommendation from Electric Capital is that what they're saying is that they should uh, start partnering with kind of like DeFi ecosystem, like private private sector, like specifically like em embracing it. Not, not, not like essentially if you want to catch up now on this gap with China, not only you need to do like, it's not about doing what they did, kind of embracing like, you know, central uh, bank currency in, in the form that they did. It, it's actually trying to outmaneuver them given that you're behind, uh, you need to come up with a strategy that's different um, and, and so the specific recommendation of this article is actually to uh, to try to go for um, like partnership with like DeFi protocols and actually embracing what's happening in DeFi. And DeFi is very early, like you know it's one of many waves that will happen, but essentially like, government has to embrace this and, and work together with it. But I'm, I'm not sure which form it will take. I mean, yeah, this is a very, very broad topic, but I think, yeah, that was a great answer. Um, you bring up DeFi, which brings me to my next question. It's a little bit more technical. Um, you know, we've seen this boom in DeFi and there's a new race to scalability. Uh, many options out there, layer two. Um, Optimist just uh, announced a, 
uh, you know, they just release like a soft launcher. Um, we have side chains, we have parachains, uh, we have bridges like the one that Nier is building uh, with Ethereum. Um, can you just give the audience an overview of like this niche and like what are what what do you like? Do you think all these uh, solutions are complementary? Do you think there's gonna be one winner eventually? Um, yeah, what are your thoughts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think solutions are quite a few of them complementary. I think by now people are starting to realize, and I'm gonna send yet another link here. <laughs> Hopefully it's not gonna be too, too much content for everyone, but essentially uh, by the end. Please, please. Keep but essentially, down. We, we did this conversation actually after DEF CON with, um, with Cosmos and Polkarot and Ethereum 2. And um, let me actually link you to it here. But everybody essentially is starting to agree that the world will be um, multi-chain. Multi so there is like no way kind of like out of it. Like we, we, like you can, like this is a content that goes for like an hour uh, on, on a free time. Somebody can, can watch if you're interested, but essentially it's moderated by James Presswich who is kind of well-known in the space when it comes to the integrations between different chains. Uh, and he's here moderating the panel with Cosmos, Polkarot, Nier, and Ethereum 2, discussing the fact that we will have to come up with standards and incentive mechanisms to, to ensure that all this kind of interoperability happening. Now, unfortunately, the, the, the uh, multi-chain guys, James Presswich, actually. Um, uh, and, um, like, unfortunately, this uh, interoperability conversations right now happening kind of like in silos. So like Polkarot is working on their own interoperability solution. Cosmos is working on their own interoperability solution. Nier is thinking about their own interoperability solution. Ethereum probably thinking like a little bit less about interoperability solution just now until, you know, other chains become um, as successful. And... Uh, uh, we all need to kind of this video it was kind of like almost beginning of this dialogue it was almost like acknowledgement that okay like standards are not figured out everybody has their own standard and 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 so i think the way it will play out is that interoperability will be done in the next year or two via bridges so bridges uh for now will serve this interoperability way so for example in case of near i don't know the architecture of other bridges in case of near our bridge works with ethereum it's two-way bridge so you can actually take assets from ethereum uh, play like nft battle on near and the new metadata that gets created from the battle, such as like my NFT won your NFT, can go back to, let's say, like OpenSea or back on Ethereum. So you can actually have interoperability back and forth uh, through the bridge, but only between two chains. And so the longer term uh, vision is that this technologies will be kind of like more generalized. So not only is it just going to be bridge between near and Ethereum, it will be actually interoperability between chains that will be kind of like participating. In, in kind of like the, the the blockchain ecosystem now the question another kind of question you ask is like whether it will be kind of winner takes all versus winner takes most versus like very heterogeneous uh, kind of environment like how many of these technologies will actually be relevant i think it will be a convergence on a couple standards um and so that going forward the way kind of like i think about it is that There'll be two different standards going forward for developers, um, at least when you think about layer ones. One standard being um, you have to build your own chain, like um, we call it like uh, app chain standard. And that's what like Polkarot is advocating for. That's what Cosmos is advocating for. The trade-offs there is that you will be able to control kind of configuration of your shard or infrastructure, but you'll need to be able to like secure the validators. So, and, and you need to have like larger team, like app team. So it will serve, it will be a better fit probably for like larger companies. So you, 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 we see like Terra, this larger Korean company, Binance a, a building with this approach in mind. And the second approach in mind is more of a like near approach or Ethereum 2 approach is approach of where you give up configuration of the hardware per se, but you do not need to hire the application team. And we call it like Epson shards approach where, where like it's hom homogeneous infrastructure versus the other approaches, heterogeneous infrastructure. So I think there'll be those two approaches and there'll be maybe like three, four, five main solutions for developers, but I, I don't think it will be more than that. If anything, maybe it will collapse down to like two or three by later because otherwise it will be like too fragmented. Thanks, Max. That was a, that was a great overview. Um, I want to switch gears now and talk a little bit. I, I started these meetings by saying that we were going to be more business focused. Um, and I'd love to have you here because you work very, very closely with both investors and entrepreneurs in the crypto space. Um, so my first question to you is, uh, 
uh, to this topic. Um, is crypto disrupting the way we build software startups, uh, both in a way of like how we ship product and in a way like these entrepreneurs are raising funds? Because uh, like what we're seeing right now is mainly, you know, layer ones raising money from VCs or from token sales uh, and that go funding applications uh, uh, that, you know, enhance their ecosystem. Uh, um, and also like um, crypto startups can just tokenize themselves, as you said in the beginning, uh, and like raise uh, like a lot of capital without like the need to wait for an IPO and wait 10 years. Um, so can you talk a little bit about like this, this new shift, uh, if you see it, uh, and do you think the Silicon Valley model of how we build startup soft, software startups um, is kind of done? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a super interesting question because I think it's kind of like um, there are components that's kind of the same and then there are components where it's very, very different. Um, so I think what's interesting and very different about the crypto landscape is that I remember a conversation I had was the first employee of Compound, uh, my, my friend Kelvin. He actually gave me like the first finance job like 10 years ago. And so what was interesting about him, I was asking him, like, why did you join Compound specifically? And so he was like, well, specifically in this industry, what's different is that people built startups but in the open so and what he means by that is not even open source he means like I, well i could have just joined their discord at any point in time and so he actually how he decided to work with compound he actually went to a whole bunch of discords and other like community chats and he started talking to people like to founders like it was like early days like very like bare bones kind of like early projects but they're all built in open at any point in time you can join in and, and join the conversation kind of like what is being built here and similar to how like buff has a discord right and you can like uh, presumably kind of join right um and so the um the difference here is that unlike let's say like enterprise software company or something like this built in silicon valley here i can actually jump in and kind of like ask around like founder of the team like hey what, what are you doing what's your strategy like have you thought about this um you can see if it's a good fit for you you can and essentially that's how he found this startup he did a bunch of like speed dating with a bunch of different protocols and like really like the founding team of Compound, and that's how he joined Compound. So by just jumping into the Discord, essentially. Um, that's one thing that's definitely different in, in the space. Another thing, as you mentioned, is actually funding. So approaches to funding right now are kind of like more democratized in a way. So you can uh, do a token sale, you can you can do, um, you can do uh, different kinds of crowdfunds. For example, there are like pl places like Republic, and there are places like CoinList. Um, you can do fair launch. There are places, uh, organizations like Fair Launch Capital that are trying to serve this new model, kind of like let, let's do more fair launches. You can go traditional route and work with Web3 investors. And so we, we've seen as actually like diversity of options when it comes to startup funding, for example. Um, but, but then also, it's also important to mention that some things are actually very important to take the, from the playbook of, of Silicon Valley. And so what I mean by this is, what I see startups struggling with a lot in the crypto space is actually ability to ship quickly. So not be like academic, but actually like deploy software, like let's ship and iterate. Let, let's not make it perfect. Let's actually ship it. Um, where I see a lot of kind of like, th that's where a lot of like playbook of like project management, product management um, can be just taken playbook from 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 the Silicon Valley and, and, and get startups to ship quickly and iterate based on feedback. And another piece is, um, that's similarly important to take just from Silicon Valley playbook is like adoption, for example, like what I do, some of it comes from like sil kind of sil Silicon Valley playbook, like for example, like how do you do process, how do you do like pipeline management or something like this. Um, and so I think it's nuanced. Some of the things like open source projects do differently. And some of the things actually you, you, you'd be rather be better off taking just things from the playbook because playbook for Silicon Valley was actually developed from 1960s, right? Um, actually, another another item uh, in the playbook, uh, uh, very important, is customer acquisition. Um, and I think, uh, you know, crypto companies uh, like have an advantage there as well, because if you decide to build on a layer one, um, you kind of like you adopt all the users that the, that particular protocol already has. Um, so you don't really like. You, ha you start by having like your initial, you know, lead customers, uh, people that can give you feedback, uh, people that call, uh, and you don't actually need, especially if you're an engineer, you know, like customer acquisition uh, um, can be a burden. Like you can spend a lot of money 
and you can actually end up nowhere. Um, so I think that's actually a you know pretty important and a pretty big advantage. Uh, do you think this type of advantage will uh, um, you know will put uh, will put like web two applications like out of the race? Will be you know so much better for web three apps in the future? Yeah, so there are like a couple different approaches. I think even within this, you can kind of take some things from Silicon Valley Playbook. You can build like viral loops in your product, for example, or you can take, to your point, you can maybe uh, build community and, and and build community before product exists and, and, and get feedback from them ahead of time, right? So like, I think there are many different approaches. You can take some of it from Silicon Valley. I was just having a call earlier today with co-founder of Graph Protocol and we were brainstorming an idea of like killer app on, on Nier or how we together can do a killer app. And we were talking about this idea of events app, for example. And so he uh, he he developed actually quite a few things in in um, in, in in there. They created the registry of all of the applications in space in crypto space, and they created the self claim button there. And so it's kind of like how like in Yelp, like local businesses can come in and claim the page here. They saw that a lot of like hundreds of startups in, in crypto space actually come to their website and actually claim themselves as so like this is my page kind of thing, um, and that's awesome. That that's like a kind of playbook you take from Silicon Valley, and and and, and you know if good good people at product can actually say like oh yeah I can create like those viral loops and and, and have people like self identify themselves and start using my product. On the other hand, you can take this new playbook to your point and and actually uh, build a community and and, uh, and I think like the the big emphasis here moves away in a way like for us at near what's interesting is that thinking about marketing what is the function of marketing versus what is the function of the community it's it's like startups were built with a lot of like marketing kind of like your top of the funnel in in a way right and and maybe sales is like bottom of the funnel or something like this in traditional startups and here we are building this layer one that has many different constituents like validators developers like founders um like token holders um guilt leaders, guilt members. And the question is like for the, all of these people, like what is the better approach? Is it like actually like improving things on the marketing side? Or is it actually building community? And so for a lot of these people actually building community, this approach is actually more important, which is also very kind of interesting under developed kind of like skill set, I would say, like community managers in, in a space. Like if, if we can bring like people who are like really good at building communities and very like um, um, very thoughtful about it and deliberate about it, um, that can, you know, make or break a uh, crypto startup, I think. Uh, I agree. Um, just to double down this point, because I think it's pretty interesting. Um, so I was, I was mentioning before, you know, like you, you start building, let's, you know, let's say like a DeFi product. Uh, um, you already know that like, if you build something that is like valid and solid, uh, people are just going to use it. Uh, if it's attractive enough, uh, um, you'll get like users almost instantly. Um, what about uh, um, you know web free applications that are like addressing industries that are outside of crypto? Though there's still like like a customer acquisition process. And correct me if I'm wrong, but you were mentioning, for example, events. There's so much competition, so many solutions out there for events. They really have to go out there to get those customers. Um, do you think this is going to be harder for web free apps? Uh, just like, you know, because you also have to educate the users about the, you know, all the, the pros of using blockchain. Um, and also will this, you know, since you work for a layer one, uh, are, is near like helping entrepreneurs in this process? Uh, um, are you guys approaching this as something that like the entrepreneur has to do? you know, him or herself, uh, and then, you know, come back with some results. Uh, um, yeah, what's your approach there? And how do you see this? Mm -hmm. uh, so, so your question is mainly uh, the second piece, or what, can you maybe re repeat the first piece? Sorry, yeah, there was a lot there. Um, I, I like more like, you know, if you can just like talk a little bit about like the customer acquisition process uh, for like, um, you know, crypto apps that are going outside of the crypto space uh, and whether layer ones are, are helping in this or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's actually interesting. I, what comes to mind is example of actually the project um, I'm kind of pretty involved with uh, um, in, a, in a capacity of like just helping them whenever I have time is Flux Protocol. So they're actually building prediction market uh, on Nier. They're based in Germany. And so what's interesting is that recently they raised some money and I helped them to 
uh, to source their first kind of adoption person. Uh, she's she's my good friend for 10 plus years, and I was kind of like brainstorming with her. How is her job different from my job in a way? Because um, is a layer one protocol. Um, I, my, my kind of total addressable market are existing entrepreneurs in space in a way. So I, I go and talk to, in a way, I start by talking to Web3 people. And I don't, I don't need to convince them it's like why blockchain? They kind of like already convince themselves. And so it's more... For them, it's more about evaluating different platforms. And there are a couple hundred of them. So like 500 applications um, are roughly kind of like exist in the space, kind of like more mature applications, a lot more like early stage applications. Um, and that's a good enough total addressable market. And so on the other hand, when I talked to, uh, to her, when she joined Flux Protocol about her approach, I was thinking about like, what's her addressable market? Uh, it's, a, it's a prediction market. Okay, so like there are some traditional industries to your point there. For example, like financial derivatives is one application. Um, sport betting is another application. And there are people, there are tons of people. In fact, we did analysis on Crunchbase and there are hundreds of teams doing sport betting and thousands of teams doing like financial derivatives. But then none of them know crypto. Uh, like, and, 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 and so then it becomes a lot more challenging, right? It's like, okay, so what do you talk to them about? Well, you need to have a lot more educational materials. You actually need to, like when I do my work, actually, um, I, I keep it very con conversational and informal. Like I, I don't have like a slide deck to educate people on like why blockchain because again, they convince themselves already. <laughs> um, and, and on the other hand, in, in her case, she actually had to create a, um, um, the slide deck explaining why prediction markets are, are like even relevant before even talking about flux, she has to convince people on this new approach in a way, which which takes a lot more education, a lot more. Like I think her position is like way more challenging than like what I'm um, kind of working on. So I think that that's that's like one example. And in terms of like how how we can help founders, so essentially, essentially like what's good to mention here is what Cameron just sent the link in in the chat is Open Web Collective is our incubator and accelerator for founders. And what we uh, focus on there, why, why we think a lot about it is that from the beginning, Nier was born kind of in San Francisco. Now it's like all over the place, the, the, t the team is like everywhere. Um, but, but we were thinking from like Silicon Valley approach, like helping founders kind of like almost creating like YC mindset, winning a lot of times found, founder, founding teams, not on merits of technology, uh, but on, on, on business, like helping them on the business side when it comes to like adoption, hypothesis around like how to approach product market fit or, or like trivial things, how like which bank to start if you're a crypto founder. Um, and, and so we've been very actively helping founders um, uh, consistently and we kind of formalize this approach by starting this, this program. Um, and we ran the first batch last year with like nine startups. Um, and that was like 12 week program and we're running the new batch right now with anywhere i think between 10 and 15 uh startups there i'm actually forgetting the exact number and so we, we're, we're trying to help founders uh, on, on different um, things there and i would say that the approach there for each founder is very different so i would actually like talk to every founder and i'll ask them essentially like like okay we have three months together like what do you like what are the big big kind of like top of the mind bottlenecks for you like because maybe some of them we can unblock these founders are like you know, crypto native, let's say, or crypto educated people versus like non crypto educated people. Yeah, for those founders, actually, like ninety percent already crypto educated, uh, and it's it's um, it's kind of good and bad. Like, on one hand, uh, they're kind of crypto native; they understand like use cases more natively. They understand maybe how to build community more natively. On the other hand, I would also prefer to start like i would love to see more like repeat entrepreneurs joining the space and so for, for example like compound founder when he joined the space he wasn't crypto native at that time but he actually built two successful startups before and, and th this particular kinds of people who like have been through this and learned a lot they're actually extremely valuable for like, our ecosystem and i only know of like that i personally deal with maybe like less than five like repeat entrepreneurs kind of like who I work closely with. And so to me, it indicates that there is a lot of like young talent, talent in, the, in the space, like first time entrepreneurs, but somehow the industry is not doing a good job at like education itself. It's it's not enough of like uh, uh, people who who have been very, very successful, like outside of crypto who are joining today. It's not, it's not quite like something is missing on, on like education. We try our best in terms of education, but <laughs> we're, 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 you know, we're getting there, but um, actually Thanks. just brings Great. me to my next question. Um, so like, I actually like before in the networking uh, uh, portion, you know, um, was talking to Christopher actually, um, who's, who's a non-native entrepreneur, who sees crypto as very valuable, who sees applications of crypto in a, in a specific industry, 
where he has an expertise on, uh, but he cannot match those two things. Uh, um, the barrier to entrance seems to be very high. So how can we all like, how can the industry, you know, um, get better attracting, you know, these this talents that you were also talking about, you know, people who have built successful startups, uh, who recognize the value of crypto, uh, but, you know, maybe, you know, that educational gap uh, keeps them out. Do you think education is everything? Um, do you think like also, you know, in terms of tooling, what, what type of tooling are out there? Maybe, you know, if you can talk about like also what NIR has to offer, you know, in that sense. Yeah, so I, I, I'm actually very biased in, in thinking that edu educational gaps, there are different kind of educational gaps are like really big in the, in the crypto space. And, and there's, you guys do an amazing job on, on the like university side of things, right? Um, and then there is like so much more, like even in our, like at NIR, we have people who've been, it was a, was a, was a project for like two plus years. And they're like actually um, like not quite understanding how crypto primitives, like mechanism design of the token and things like that can help with adoption, for example, or like liquidity strategy. Like how, like how do you, how do you bootstrap liquidity using the crypto primitives? And, and that's people in, in, in near don't know how, like how to approach it. They, they've been in the industry presumably for like two plus years, but some of them maybe like didn't, didn't dive deeper on this. And so like, I think that education is just very, very challenging for some reason. It, it, the I, th I think what the industry can do better is use less of a, lingo like for example like every time you read like DeFi articles you would see like amm and uh, other kind of terms which are not that hard of a terms but when, whenever people see terms they're like okay like cognitive load like maybe maybe i don't have enough time today like I, i'm gonna come back to this article later and learn There's a bunch of new tabs that you need to open <laughs> when you when you don't you know you don't understand acronyms but yeah exactly and, and another piece is just like understanding like use cases and what's possible that can, like kind of like and, and that's even like <laughs> those are two another sets of education like use cases on use cases what's important is like for example like uh um uh pioneering like uh, evangelizing what what audios is doing like what i was just mentioning music streaming service but actually has economy on top of it so it allows musicians to get paid but also but also it allows uh, musicians to upload reused content of other musicians it's like a very unique concept that uh, make, makes it stand out it you cannot do it on soundcloud you cannot do it on spotify by the way musicians can get paid a lot more and that's built with crypto primitives in 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 mind and so like dissecting those things explaining like here's a use case it's brand new it has like it's a music streaming app but has economy on top of it um or or like for example there's a uber competitor in canada that is a driver owned it's called eva.coop right and it, it it's a cooperative drivers actually sell their riders on the service because unlike uber uh, which is another popular service in the same city in, in montreal this service eva actually makes drivers the owners in the system so they actually sell riders on, on using it um and, and so explaining those use cases it's like it, it is it's a crypto native use case right to the entrepreneurs to get them inspired to get their like gears kind of going to to get them to think about what's possible, uh, I think that's important. And another thing is like in terms of technologies and, and, and the enablers of use cases, it's, it's another educational gap where Ethereum enabled particular kinds of use cases. Like I call it um, like high value, low volume transfers. Like DeFi is an example of that. It's like, um, like for example, like lending protocol that you use, uh, like Compound, for example, um, you use it very uh, infrequently, right? You, you would use it like once kind of in a blue moon uh, and that works really well on Ethereum. On the other hand, people tried a lot of use cases on Ethereum, like related to like social, for example, um, where the interaction is a lot more frequent. Users need to use blockchain a lot more or audios. They have the listener data use case on the blockchain where a lot of more data come in on, on a blockchain. And this is actually not possible on, the, on Ethereum because of like throughput limitations on the first version of Ethereum at least. And so on the other hand, like for, for Nier, the big challenge for me is like, I actually know exactly like what's possible, what we can enable at Nier. But the world doesn't know, <laughs> and 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 we have some educational materials, but not quite. Kind of like, here is your go-to kind of like of what it, this technology actually enables, and it's actually very challenging. It will it will take, unfortunately, two, three, four, five years for entrepreneurs to try and play around with ideas. Similarly, how in two thousand seventeen, uh, there was this build-up, bunch of teams built a bunch of different use cases. Let's say like hundred use cases were tried. But eighty-five of them actually failed, you know, and 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 it's normal, right? It's experimentation. People try different things, and and then by the end of it, you have this amazing DeFi ecosystem, right? Like lending protocols, are like really working, uh, AMMs really working, stablecoin 
it has a real demand for it, right? But but like the other use cases that people tried actually didn't work out on the previous infrastructure phase. And now there is a new infrastructure phase, like near is one of them, but there are others um, where the new applications will be possible. But it will take, unfortunately, because of this lack of education, it will take years for people to try and kind of some of the things will work out. And so it almost becomes interplay between infrastructure and applications. You know, you have new applications, they have demand for infrastructure, the new infrastructure comes up, then there are new applications and it's kind of like constant interplay. And education is very important there. Yeah, I agree. And I think that there's also another factor here because like, it, it always seems like uh, um, they always have to tokenize your, your project uh, um, in order to like, like generate a revenue stream per se. Do you see the classic, going back to the Silicon Valley playbook, do you see the classic SaaS model uh, uh, still feeding in for crypto application? Or do you think that like you have to create a token in order to raise capital or in order to get that, you know, that funding that you need early on to, to be able to build like a successful product? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. Like, I would actually reframe this question a little bit and, and more think from the maybe angle of value accrual is like, okay, so you, you, you build something on a technology, you get adoption, and then the, hopefully you'll accrue some of the value from, from what you provide, right? And so like in, in, in crypto so far, it seems like there is a, this smile curve, um, I call it, where essentially if you think about um, uh, on one side, you're very close to the consumer, in, in the case of crypto example would be like Coinbase or Binance are very close to the consumer, like trader, um, to people who like buy and sell coins, for example, that's one example of consumer. And those applications tend to accrue, accrue value. So like Binance is a huge company, um, Coinbase is a huge company. On the other side of the smile curve is like, you're very removed from the user. It's like your layer one protocol. It's like near Ethereum, Polkadot. And, and that's where also people kind of like think that that's where value accrues now the challenge becomes in 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 the middle like if you're not quite close to the user if you can like some kind of like intermediary there um it's actually very challenging to 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 accrue value and so i think i think i think th 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 i think uh projects need to be like very uh very, very thoughtful i think about token economics um and 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 and, and one example that comes from my are like DeFi aggregators you know um you know they don't necessarily have a token but you know like i, I mean they get they get percentage on, on fees on transaction fees i guess that's their business model um yeah i'm thinking you know out, outside because like blockchain enables like you know very flexible architecture like we're talking about like way more modular software um that can be created not like you know hyper vertical siloed software and this can like span across like every industry um so you know like and some of this industry like a token wouldn't make sense it's just like providing a service uh, um so that's why i was wondering but um i like yeah the, the, the smile curve actually is a, it's a great example and you know i think it, it paints a, a great picture um cool we're kind of getting to the end i see some questions uh, here um there are already so many apps built on Ethereum. Why should someone build on Near? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so as I was mentioning earlier, the kind of technology kind of goes in this cycles of interplay of infrastructure and applications. And so the new kinds of applications that are possible demand new kind of infrastructure. So for example, audios again, um, uh, bringing this example for another time is the kinds of application kind of application where the blockchain component of this in their cases listening data actually cannot live on ethereum it's just impossible um, and so we also see some projects today that have been priced out on, on, on ethereum so like in ethereum goes through fluctuations of the price that sometimes prices out the projects to today example is like nft marketplaces so like nft marketplaces are very hard to actually um, make work today or social tokens, for example, in Ethereum, given that current kind of bull market and, and where the prices are. And so near is essentially a place for people to both get cheap prices, but also our approach to usability is very different. So we, we built kind of, we completely kind of rethought how onboarding is done, how the transactions are, whether they're like abstracted away from the users and how account model is done. There is a good article about it that kind of, um, kind of talks about the pain points in the space. I'll, I'll actually link people to it here. 
um, and, and, and so the usability is actually another huge component there. And so for us, like the usability component and cheap transactions, those two pieces enable for different use cases and actually go in for the mass market user because of the usability. Um, and, and, and so I think near inherently fundamentally uh, enables different class of applications that actually isn't possible in Ethereum, uh, Ethereum one. Now we will be competitive to Ethereum two, I think, uh, but the, in terms of Ethereum one and what near enables is fundamentally different class of applications. Got it. Um, Adele asks, um, why not just tax the outramp? You can trade as much as you like, then you pay an, uh, on exit to fiat. Uh, sorry, can you please repeat this question? Yeah, um, why not just tax the outramp? Uh, you can trade as much as you like, then you pay on exit to fiat. Um, maybe it was referred to something we were talking about before. Um, hmm. Adele, if you want to add to that, maybe in the chat, um, we can get to that later. Um, yep. How does Nier validate its ledger? How does Nier validate its ledger? Mm. So the question is how does the consensus mechanism work or is it how, how, how do validators participate in the network or like, I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe that one can also be like rephrased a little bit. Um, uh, yeah, great. Uh, consensus mechanism. Consensus mechanism. So NIR has its own consensus mechanism. I'll, I'll actually link here to kind of the paper, the formal paper that kind of like describes how it works. Um, and so in this paper, there will be a section three on the page 21 that actually talks um, about this thing called nightshade. And that's, that's kind of like our approach to just like longer read um, and more f formal read, but it kind of explains the differences between different uh, consensus approaches and also why we had to come up with our own. Yeah, so I would refer people to that one. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that. Actually, Adele, uh, oh, great. Uh, to help adoption of crypto mainstream reduce the tax complexity. I think this is actually a great topic, especially with the staking economy, um, especially in the US, <laughs> uh, especially if you're staking in if 2 there's like a staking reward every six minutes or so. Um, Apparently, as we are, as for now, for with like the current uh, legislation, apparently you would have to report every single staking reward that you get, which is kind of crazy. Um, yeah. So, how do you see that? Also, you know, also if you can talk maybe on Nier's perspective, uh, how you guys are approaching that, or in general. The uh, tax question is definitely uh, challenging, I would say. We have um, complexities, as we mentioned here, ju just now related to, for example, staking rewards. And uh, I'm actually right now in the process of actually jumping on the call with a couple, couple specialists in the space who like understand how this works. And we will have to like, uh, in near, we have, we'll have to educate everyone in, in near on, on staking rewards and how to do taxes. And I think it's a question that everybody has in their mind and people will have potentially different approaches to it, given that lack of, lack of, uh, it, it's very complex and lack of education on the space. So like, we're going to try to streamline and educate everyone on, on, on that front, but it's definitely, um, it, it's a challenging topic. Okay. Let's put our faith in Minister Gensler. Maybe that would help. <laughs> um, Last question from the audience. Oh. Kapol, uh, does NIR have a grant program? If so, what kind of projects are you looking for? Yeah, so for the grant program, actually, so there is a link here. I'll link people to the grant program in the, in the chat. And so the the grants we process right now, I'm actually not part of the grant committee, but uh, it takes usually three, four, five uh, weeks, sorry. And pe uh, people do it in waves. So essentially they review every single application that comes in. We don't have just yet kind of recommendation on the space, kind of like what kinds of things uh, we want people to apply with. But there, there is a, um, a, a particular, particular actually link I'll send that we, we started as a way to crowdsource ideas about it. It's from our forum. Uh, tools missing in the ecosystem and we ask people to essentially um, provide different kinds of things that we think uh, public goods that like open source components that are important to have for near ecosystem and so eventually we'll make it into like a nice blog post or some other piece of content where we provide we'll provide guidance but for now we look at things on an inbound basis so when, whatever ideas people apply with we review every single application and give away grants it takes just wanted to mention again it takes three four five weeks to to process it but I highly encourage people to apply. We we have plenty of uh, tokens to give away, and 
I think we, we did a good job on application side, application founder side. We we almost like playing a little bit of a catch up on ecosystem side of things, the, the way I kind of think about it. And and so definitely we would love to give give away a lot of grants this year. Awesome. Um, ooh, more more on the technical side. Why didn't Near go with a sharded blockchain architecture? Why did Near, uh, did Near go with a sharded architecture? Uh, and not one that scales with advances in hardware like Solana. Yeah, that's actually like really interesting. Um, I'll send another piece of content here. So there is a there is a video here from YouTube of two founders, one from Solana. Oh, I watched that. Yeah. That's that's great. That's a good one. <laughs> it talks about sharding versus non-sharding, and it's it starts by Anatoly from Solana essentially saying sharding sucks, you know, <laughs> and uh, it kind of goes into. <laughs> Super interesting conversation. They also have, by the way, Solana has um, a podcast that's called No Sharding, and so they're 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 almost oh, like okay. it's their brand was built around No Sharding, and so um, I think it's fundamentally two different approaches. It's one is the approach through the hardware, so it's a more of a more of a like uh, the team at Solana they actually spend a lot of time at like Qualcomm and, and places like this optimizing hardware to its T, and so they're like specialists in. In optimizing hardware and so like they're really good at this particular approach of optimizing hardware uh, and and you kind of like th there are trade-offs there you have like very good throughput right now they're like very good at performance um, um but then you need to have this beefy servers so like validators have to have like uh, big machines in order to, to run it and a near approach and you, you can call it scale up approach to to scaling blockchains and near approach you can call it like scale out it's more of a like random piece of hardware um kind of like more over time decentralized but but also sharding is more complex and uh kind of has its own kind of questions around like cross shard communication security models and things like that and actually that video that you're referring to i see anatoly makes an argument like you cannot build the next facebook on a sharded blockchain um do you agree oh, no, our engineering team thinks that you can. <laughs> okay, cool. I I actually li like this type of competition because I think it's like it's healthy competition. And also going back to what we're seeing like at the beginning in terms of like interoperability and like this this world of different blockchains, uh, um, Solana and Nier are not mutually exclusive. They like both of them can exist. Both of them can find their use cases. Correct me if I'm wrong. Correct me if you want to wipe Solana out. Uh, of the ecosystem, <laughs> but that's... Oh, the, I see Sebastian here. Uh, for, if I, if my memory is right, he works at Solana. So, like, I, I don't want to mention anything uh, uh, here about Solana that will in any way uh, <laughs> on the negative side. It's a friendly competition. I agree. I actually highly recommend people who are kind of interested in education of of, of kind of like different approaches to look at this also YouTube series. And we interviewed Solana. We interviewed Ethereum two team. Uh, we interviewed Polkarot. We actually borrowed some ideas from Polkarot's approach, um, and and uh, this is just like a good place. Like I, I like this because it's like open source. It, it's it's open source community where people like share ideas, and we, we only had like five different blockchains that didn't show up for this particular YouTube uh, whiteboard series because they're kind of closed sourced, and there is a very high correlation between who didn't show up there and who actually ended up going out of business or didn't build developer community. <laughs> so I, I think building in, in the open. And collaborating on ideas is like very important thesis of the space. And even though we're kind of like competitors for the developer mind share, we're also collaborators in terms of like idea sharing. Agreed. Um, Hope is asking if you can drop a link to the grant program. Yep. We so might have done right. before. Yeah, um, Apologies, that um, I didn't specify it, but essentially I resent it just now. So. It's uh, the submittable form. That's a grand program. I just sent it in chat. I, yeah, I highly recommend to apply. What do you think about a cross-chain explorer? Cross-chain explorer. Is it uh, something that essentially looks at um, everything I that's guess, happened? I guess addresses on like like different blockchains, I would assume. That would be like really interesting to see at some point. Um, I, I was just talking um, to, to the Graph co-founder about the kind of like um, registry of all of the like reputational data of people's information sitting in across different chains. They're thinking a lot about cross-chain kind of approach, and and so I, I'm I'm very curious. Maybe not so much in explorer data. Oh, I'm for NFT, in... sorry, Gideon has uh, uh, like I guess cross-chain explorer for NFT. Cross-chain explorer for NFTs. Um, so uh, I would say that 
that would be like really cool actually to be able to have like re repository of all of the assets regardless of where they live on which chain and i think we're definitely gonna get there and so like what comes to mind is that i was talking for the last couple of weeks to this gaming studio that specifically builds the um, uh, the game across as many chains as possible. It's only second time I, I saw it in, in my experience where people are trying to go like, like five, six different chains to, to support, but they specifically want to build this experience where gamers actually don't have no idea where the assets are living. They're just like playing the game and there's a blockchain underneath it, you know? Yeah. Uh, like you just want to be sure you have all your skins there and, you know, <laughs> all your weapons. <laughs> um, could I have one last question that I really wanted to ask you? Um, background, uh, you're working in the space. Uh, um, can you give some advices for, you know, um, people that are not engineers, uh, specifically since we, you know, we, we work with universities and students, particularly non-technical recent graduates uh, that want to get into the industry? Um, what are the best first steps? Uh, because you know, like crypto is very complicated. Again, going back to, to the education gap, uh, um, that oftentimes you know it might seem too big of a burden. So you just go work for Facebook. Um, so what, like, can you give just some some tips also? Because you 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 went from like a traditional industry into crypto. Um, so what are the things that you proactively need to do? Mm -hmm. Well, so uh, I'll mention a couple of things. One is, uh, even though I was in crypto for two and a half years, I also have my own blind spots. Like I kind of know how to do certain things, but I am like still not fully Web3 native, I think at some point, at, at certain things, for example. Uh, that's important to mention is like, uh, like being Web3 native, it, it, it's a process. And I think it takes, like you need to be fully immersed in this. Um, in terms of in terms of after college and looking for jobs, I would also mention two things. Kind of separately address two things. One is when I was in college, I actually I thought that I, I know what I want to do, <laughs> and I ended up going into like finance, worked in technology mergers and acquisition. I like the technology. I like really didn't like the finance aspect of it, for example. And so it took me, for example, personally, like three, four different experiences. I worked in finance. I tried to start my own company. Kind of blew through all my savings doing that. Worked in sales and marketing. Uh, to 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 uh, and then uh, start up like near where I was working from very very beginning to finally like understand what what I like personally but I'll, what what kind of gives me energy but also what, what is my my unique skill set it's very important I think to understand like what is, what is your unique skill what do you what do you bring to the table and what I mean by this um, what I mean by this is not particular like function kind of like oh you're like product manager or whatever I, th I think people are just like uh, very unique at particular things. And, and the faster people can discover like what they're unique uh, at. For me, it's like 10, took 10 years to discover. Uh, <laughs> if, if you discovered it in college, that's amazing. So I think number one is figure out like, what are you good at? Like, what, 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 what are you so good that, you know, it, it, it doesn't feel like work to you even, right? Um, and in terms of like looking for jobs, what I would do, I would actually, my approach is like very like, pipeline management and process heavy, but I would essentially create a list of projects that you want to participate. There, there are tools in space where you can actually map the space really well. At, at Nier, we use this tool called, called PeachBook, and I think people probably know it, but like, for example, Crunchbase. It's quite expensive though, PeachBook. <laughs> You're right, for students, it's probably uh, not, not the best option. Um, the, well, um, there are, for example, some websites like cryptocurrencyjobs, for example, .com, um, where like essentially like if I were in, in the shoes of somebody who is trying to trying to find a job, I would do like three things. No, number one, try to create a, a map of the space and I would actually go crazy. I would create like 100 projects. So like more than 100 projects, like actually like like put a ton of effort into this, maybe a couple of days or whatever it will take. To, to map the space then i would actually what i do uh, and it's again specific to like my skill set i'll try to s socially kind of like engineer it i would try to find the people in those companies that actually hiring for the positions that you care about so i would go to the websites after you create the map of the space i would look at what they're hiring for i would cr like creating this crazy spreadsheet kind of like list of who is actually hiring based on what you need i would get to 20 30 40 of them 50 of them I'll then go to LinkedIn and, and and find who is actually the right decision maker on the recruiting site in those companies. And then step number three, I would actually figure out who do I know who is connected to those people and I would apply only through warm referrals. I would add a step number four, which is talk to Andrew. 
who's a BAF recruiting lead. He's doing an amazing job in, uh, um, you know, actually, you know, mediating this, uh, these two worlds, uh, you know, crypto, crypto companies and talents. Uh, um, so feel free to reach out to Andrew. I see he's dropping some, some thumbs up in the chat. Um, I ran out of question. Um, if you guys have any more questions for Sasha, um, otherwise we can move to networking. Let's see. Let's give it a couple of minutes. Actually, really quick, like follow up to this BD job question, Sasha, because um, it, it, it like like oftentimes, yes, you can do all this work and stuff, but then like you're very proactive, but then like you go and talk to these companies and like you don't have that knowledge that, you know, that crypto knowledge and companies are looking for people that are ready to go, even in like marketing roles or like business roles. Uh, they're looking for people who really understand the industry. So do you think it's just like a matter of time where, you know, as these companies grow and they will need like different, you know, set of skills uh, and like less crypto native people. Uh, uh, do you think it's just a matter of time, uh, uh, you know, or just do, do people need to educate themselves, uh, um, you know? Yeah, definitely people I think need to self-educate and, and I think interview process, like, you know, there, you need to get in your foot into the door. So you need to get the interview and that's like warm referrals, like working with people like Andrew probably is a good way to get there maybe the first step. And then second, you need to really impress. You need to show that you've done your homework. You're actually like very thoughtful about your approach during the interview process, right? And And kind of like, in a way, it's a numbers game. You need to talk to a ton of people to get to the interviews and then actually uh, succeed at them. Um, and it, it, it's it's a feedback loop. You kind of talk to more people, you do more interviews, you kind of like understand what people ask and things like that. You become better, you learn a, as you go. Um, but uh, I, I would also say that for, for near more than half of the people that are at near today, and we're like at 65 people what, uh, roughly uh, as kind of like organization, more than half of the people came from the outside of the crypto actually for us. So we have kind of like healthy mix actually early, you know, like another thing to mention here, another heuristic to mention is that earlier stage the startups are, they're actually like struggling with talent. If you like, let's say you like a uh, new project building on near from scratch and you just like raised funding and very early, nobody knows uh, you. It's actually very, very challenging to 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 um, to recruit good talent. And so, if you're a student looking for a job, you you you'd be better off actually getting your foot into the door with those startups. It's kind of a bit riskier in the sense that they're earlier stage, but also they're struggling with finding good talent. And uh, another hand, if you're like a bigger company, you might be more selective if you're doing like really well and moving on a good trajectory. So I think it's a function of how early stage the company and also what is the trajectory of the company in terms of the particular kind of like things they're looking for and, and how competitive is the job market, you know? Makes a lot of sense. Um, seeing a last question in the chat, how can one get grants uh, on a startup? especially in a region in a region that is not very well open to crypto regions like Africa. Um, enterprise Ethereum. Uh, well, I'm, yeah, I'm not a specialist on enterprise Ethereum. Start let's focus I'll... on the regional side of the question, I guess. Yeah. So for us, like for, for, for example, for like Open Web Collective, for us, we actually work with, uh, we worked in the first batch with projects uh, that serving uh, African continent. And, and right now for the second batch, we work with um, uh, the project that's doing remittances for the West Africa. Uh, so I, I, I definitely see a lot of innovation coming from Africa. Um, Binance did a lot of job there. Um, there are some particular countries like Nigeria, uh, Kenya, um, South Africa, where where I, I see quite a bit of innovation happening on the crypto side. I think some protocols focus on emerging markets more than others. For example, like Celo is a really good example of the protocol that's doing really good job on the emerging economy, uh, kind of like emerging market side, like Africa, for example. Um, and so I think I, I personally actually see quite a bit of innovation happening um, on, on Africa, so more than I expected coming into this industry. And so I think if you're looking for grants from Africa, I would just identify the target if it's an um, uh, Ethereum Enterprise. I would I would look at like who's given grants on that front. Is it like Ethereum Enterprise Alliance? Is it is it consensus? Like who who is the right organization to go for this grant? Um, 
yeah, it's always a matter of like make your case, uh, you know, consistent, find, you know, product market fit. If you propose something that makes sense, uh, um, you're proposing something that can solve a real problem. Um, you know, I think, you know, these grant programs are open. So um, I see no issues in like getting funded, honestly. Um, cool, Sasha, this was great. Uh, big pleasure to have you here. Thanks for your time. Um, we will now move to networking. Uh, if please make sure to have your camera and mic on. Uh, if you want to chat with other people, you can hop from table to table, meet uh, meet new people, make new friends. Uh, not sure, Sasha, if you can stick around. You mentioned you have another call. Um, if you can, maybe people have other follow up questions they want to ask you. But if you don't have time, no worries. I, yeah, I need to. Um, I, I promised my best friend to meet him right after, so like I need to oh, jump. Works. I'll actually last link. I know I sent a lot of links here in in the chat. Last link I will send here is my uh, Calendly. So if you, Sasha, that services is essentially the URL for for my uh, Calendly. So if you ever want to talk about something, uh, definitely don't hesitate. And it it actually worked wonders for me recently. I, I put it on Twitter. Usually I use you use it like just privately. Um, uh, and, and I put, posted on Twitter a couple of days ago, and actually somebody pitched me idea of decentralized Twitter on Nier, and that somebody is actually oh, nice. into Twitter, and, and he built two successful startups before, and he's this amazing CTO. Well, I think I think Jack is already on decentralized Twitter, no? Blue Sky? I think they're very stealth, but... Um, yeah, they're kind of like they, starting, starting going slowly, but yeah, they're super interested. <laughs> nice. Well, we'll wait for Sasha tokens then, whenever you... You know, you want to launch them, think about us. <laughs> and again, thank you so, so much, Sasha, for being here. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Um, I see everyone else on the networking portion. Thank you very much for being here. Um, have a good one. Yeah, thank you. That was like super entertaining. Bye. Bye-bye.